Hey guys, thanks for watching. In this video, we're going to be going over the week six concepts for physics 111. So starting off with two body systems, it's actually easier to go through this concept by jumping straight into an example. So that's what we're going to do here. And the example says two boxes having masses of 10 kilograms and seven kilograms respectively are pulled with a 25 Newton horizontal force across a frictionless surface as shown. What is the acceleration of the boxes and the tension in the string between them? So we're looking for our tension force in this string. And then we also have to realize that we're dealing with a two body system here. So really uh, we have to think of this almost as a unit. So when we move the blue box, the red box is also going to move in the same manner because they're tied together. So really our acceleration here is going to be equal to our acceleration here. And then we also have a tension force here from the blue box and one here from the red box. But since they're on the same string, our tension forces are also going to be the same tension force. So to start off, we're going to want to draw our free body diagrams. Uh, and we're going to do this separately for each box. So starting with the red box, we have, as usual, um, our normal force and our force of gravity. And then the only other force we really have acting on this is going to be our tension force and that rope in between the two boxes. And then when we write our F net equation, we actually realize that our uh, normal force and force of gravity are going to cancel out in this case. So here our F net is only equal to our tension force. And then we can rewrite our F net as M1 times A is equal to the tension force. And we know that our M1 is 10 kilograms times our acceleration equals the tension force. So now we have our equation for the red box. And next we're going to move on to the blue box. So here we uh, once again have our normal force and then our force of gravity. And then in this case, we have two horizontal forces. We have our tension force uh, pointing to the left and then we have our pulling force to the right. So here, our F net equation. Uh, once again, normal force and force of gravity cancel out. Um, so we're left with our pulling force minus our tension force. So here we have M2 times A is equal to the pulling force minus the tension force. And we know that this is seven kilograms. And we know that our pulling force is 25 Newtons. So now we have our two equations. And uh, basically in each equation, we're missing uh, two values. So we have two unknowns and two equations. And uh, we have to think back to algebra. Whenever we have a scenario like this, we're going to want to somehow combine the equations. So in this case, we're literally just going to add these two equations together. So starting with the left side of each equation, we have 10 kilograms plus 7 kilograms times acceleration. So we got rid of the left sides or equal to our tension force in our left equation plus our pulling force in the right equation and minus our tension force in the right equation. So our tension forces actually end up canceling out. So when we combine everything together, we get the equation 17 kilograms times acceleration is equal to 25 Newtons. And when we solve for our acceleration, we get 1.47 meters per second. So now we have our acceleration, and then the other thing we're asked for is our tension force and the rope between them. So uh, we already figured out earlier that our tension forces were going to be uh, the same. So we can choose either of these equations, and I'm going to go with this one just because it's a little simpler. So we're going to plug in what we know. We know 10 kilograms, and we now know our acceleration to be 1.47 meters per second squared. And then that's going to give us our tension force. And then when we work this out, our tension force ends up being 14.7 newtons. All right, next we'll be talking about inclined planes. 
and we're going to be going through an image with a couple different scenarios in order to give us a better idea of what actually goes on during one of these inclined plane situations. So first off, we have a ball on the left uh, that's being dropped. So we know that in this case, uh, it's going to have an acceleration equal to 9.81 meters per second squared. And then next we have a ball that's rolling on a horizontal surface. So here we know that our velocity is going to stay the same. It's going to be constant. So therefore our acceleration is going to be equal to zero. And basically what we're supposed to piece together here is that when we have a ball on an inclined surface, we're going to have an acceleration that falls between zero and 9.81. So just to get us uh, thinking more about what uh, goes on in an inclined plane situation and how to set these situations up, we're going to go through um, an example below. Basically here, we have a box on a ramp. And uh, first off, we always know that our force of gravity is going to work uh, strictly in the vertical direction. So we know it's always going to be facing directly downward. So uh, even though our box is tilted, we're still going to draw our force of gravity directly in the downward position. And then we're going to draw our y-axis perpendicular to the ramp and our x-axis parallel to the ramp. And then basically, uh, now we're going to want to find out how our gravity is going to affect the motion of this box. So the box can really only move up or down the ramp. And we know that naturally it's going to want to move down the ramp because the force of gravity is working downwards. So what we're interested in here is um, really the x component of the force of gravity. So we can split up our force of gravity into both uh, an x and a y component. And we see that better in this image below. So whenever we're going to deal with these inclined planes, we automatically want to split our force of gravity into its x and y components. And then we can also see to the left in this image, if we have an incline uh, that's a little less steep, our force of gravity in the x direction is going to be smaller and it's going to be greater in the y direction, which makes sense because if we think about it, if we put the box on a less steep ramp, it's going to have less motion. It's not going to move uh, as quickly. So therefore, the component of the acceleration uh, in the horizontal direction is going to be smaller. But then in this example over here, where we have a steeper ramp, we're going to have a greater or longer um, force of gravity in the x direction and it's going to be a little shorter in the y direction. So in this case the box would have a greater acceleration uh, in the direction of its motion. Alright next we're going to be going through an inclined plane example. And the example says a 0 0.25 kilogram cart is placed at the top of a 1.3 meter long frictionless incline set at 23 degrees up from horizontal. If the cart starts from rest, how long will it take to reach the bottom? So in order to start these inclined plane problems off, we always want to draw um, our free body diagrams, and we want to start with our plane. So we know that our x plane is always going to be parallel to the incline. So basically this is going to be our x plane here. And then we also know that our normal force is always going to be perpendicular uh, to the surface. So in this case, our normal force would be something like this. And then we also know that our force of gravity is going to be directly downward in every situation. So uh, just looking at the, at the example or at the picture, uh, we can see that really the only thing that this cart can do is move down the ramp. So we don't really have any vertical motion here uh, or a y direction motion. We're just interested in the x direction of motion. So we're going to look for the x component of our force of gravity. So our y component would look something like this. We'll call that fgy. And our x component would look something like this. We'll call it fgx. Then we also know that this angle up here, uh, through simple trig, we know that this angle is going to be equal to 23 degrees. And basically, uh, in order to find uh, our acceleration of this cart, we're going to want to look for the x component of our force of gravity. So in order to do that, we're going to use trig, um, specifically SOHCAHTOA. Um, we know that our sine theta is going to be equal to our opposite side, which is fgx, over our hypotenuse, which is going to be the force of gravity. 
and we can rephrase this to say that our FGX is equal to um, our mass times gravity times the sine of theta. So um, next we're going to set this equation equal to our mass times our acceleration because basically what we're stating here is that our only motion is going to be uh, in this x direction. So we're setting our net force equal to this equation. So when we say mass times acceleration is equal to mass times gravity times the sine of theta, we see that our masses cancel out and we can rewrite this as um, our acceleration is equal to 9.81 meters per second squared times our sine of 23 degrees. When we solve this, we get an acceleration of about 3.8 meters per second squared. And basically, uh, now we have our acceleration, but our question is going to ask us for um, how long it takes to reach the bottom. So in order to solve uh, for this, we're going to use an older equation. Um, our delta x is equal to our initial velocity times time plus one half our acceleration times time squared. And our problem says that our cart is starting from rest, so we know we can get rid of this portion of the equation because our initial velocity will be zero. And we know that our delta x is 1.3 meters because that's how long uh, our incline is, so that's how far the cart has to move to get to the bottom. And we know our acceleration is equal to 3.8 meters per second squared, and we're solving for time. And when we do solve for time, we end up getting around 0.83 seconds. So it'll take the cart around 0.83 seconds to get to the bottom of the ramp. All right, next we're going to be talking about friction, which is a force that opposes relative motion between systems and contact. And friction is always going to oppose the direction of motion. So in this image, we can see that even though it seems that the box and the ground may be somewhat smooth, when we zoom in a little closer, uh, microscopically, every surface is going to be somewhat rough. So basically, because these two surfaces are rough and are in contact with each other uh, in the way that they are, we're going to have a uh, friction force, which is going to oppose uh, whatever direction of motion we have. And then just to further break down this sliding friction, we have static friction and kinetic friction. And static friction is going to oppose the attempt to move. So this occurs before the object is even moving and it must be overcome in order to initiate motion. Then we also have kinetic friction, which is going to be sliding friction against an object already in motion. And what we can learn here is that friction is going to be proportional to the normal force. So when we have greater normal forces, we're going to have a greater friction force. And then similarly, uh, we see that it depends on the surface of contact, and it's independent of the area of contact. So basically, it doesn't really matter uh, how big the object is, but rather uh, how much of the object is actually in contact with the surface. Uh, so up here, uh, we have a graph which uh, depicts the differences between static and kinetic friction. So as we can see here with static uh, friction, our friction uh, force is always going to be uh, proportional to our pushing force, uh, but in the opposite direction. So it's going to have the same magnitude. And there's going to be a peak here, and once we overcome this peak, we're going to get the object to actually start moving. And then our friction force is going to lower to our kinetic friction, which has a constant value. And it's going to be uh, all these friction uh, values are going to be different depending on what the object is, uh, because it's dependent upon uh, how rough the surface is and how much contact the surfaces have with each other and the normal forces and such. So that'll be given uh, in each example. Uh, and then below we can see when we have uh, a small normal force, we're going to have less contact between the surfaces, so therefore our friction force is also going to be smaller. But then when we have a greater normal force, our surfaces are going to be in uh, more contact, so therefore our friction force is going to increase as well. All right, lastly, we're going to be talking about air resistance. So we can see that it depends upon the shape, size, texture, and speed of an object. So it's important to realize that air resistance is always going to be different in each scenario we go through because it's going to be dependent upon what object we're using. 
Um, and we can start off by drawing a free body diagram. So if we have a force of gravity facing downward, our air resistance is going to be facing in the opposite direction, and we'll call this R. So in this case, our F net is going to be equal to our force of gravity minus our air resistance. So therefore, mass times acceleration is equal to mass times gravity minus R. So then acceleration would be equal to G minus R over M. And now looking at this equation, we can make a couple observations. For instance, that as an object falls, it's going to speed up. So this is going to cause R to increase until A is equal to zero. So basically, um, when our object starts speeding up, this portion of our equation is going to continue to increase until it eventually reaches the value of 9.81. And in this case, uh, when we reach 9.81, um, it's going to set our total acceleration to equal to zero. So when we don't have any acceleration, our velocity is going to be constant. And when we have a constant velocity in free fall, we call this terminal velocity because it's going to be the highest velocity that we can reach. There's not going to be any more acceleration once we reach this velocity. Uh, and it's going to be different for every object, which is important to realize. And we can also see that the effect of air resistance will be small for small objects at low speeds because it's going to give us a small r. And similarly, an object with a large mass will have an acceleration closest to g, therefore air resistance will have little effect. Alright, that's all for this video guys. Thanks for watching.